Hi everybody, welcome to uh, this uh, topic of infective endocarditis. Uh, before I begin, I want to give a disclaimer that I should be giving on, on every video from now on. Um, and it's essentially just letting you guys know that this is all my own um, reading. Um, I'm an analyzing different literatures, literature reviews, um, but at the same time, I want you guys to also read this literature before taking uh, my advice. This is definitely not medical advice. This is purely for my own learning, um, so I'm putting these videos out there for you guys to hopefully get something out of it. But in a, essentially, I also want you guys to um, consult with your physicians if you're a patient or if you're a healthcare provider, consult with um, your attending before uh, providing any of the information that I give as um, clinical uh, data uh, to employ to your, pa to your patients that you're seeing. Uh, so bef before I begin, I want to briefly discuss this article called Infective Endocarditis. Uh, it was published in uh, April 2013. It was just a clinical practice review of clinical data that we know it. Um, and I am going to add a couple new recent literatures on top of this one. Um, but they begin. The, they start the article uh, describing a case about a 55-year-old gentleman with a history of mitral regurgitation uh, who was seeking care after he had a transient episode of right arm weakness and speech difficulties. Uh, a month prior, he underwent um, dental scaling. Um, he was noted to have intermittent fevers and weight loss. On exam, he had a regurgitant murmur uh, that seemed like he had it chronically. Uh, he ended up getting a transthoracic echocardiogram that showed he had a mobile 12 millimeter mitral valve vegetation and a grade 2 regurgitation. Uh, MRI, they were concerning for his stroke because of his arm weakness, so they got an MRI of the brain that showed he had uh, ischemic lesions. So that's a good case um, that we can start and we'll talk about different risk factors and um, use criteria, the management, and new recent data. Uh, but the big question is how should the patient be further evaluated and treated? And after the end of this discussion, I want you guys to fully understand uh, the different treatment modalities, modalities for effect, patients with infective endocarditis. Uh, and this video is definitely not going to be exhaustive. Um, endocarditis itself is a very, very uh, complicated topic. Um, I'm going to just give you broad strokes about this. Um, so to start with epidemiological data, um, there is a higher predominance for male to female ratio of two to one. Uh, risk factors, as you guys know from med school, is patients with any prosthetic valves, and any intracardiac intra devices, any congenital heart diseases, as well as any prior history of an effective endocarditis. Um, but a lot of times, 50% of patients actually do not have um, prosthetic valves. They have a, what we call the native valve, meaning uh, they don't have any um, valves, valvular um, issues in the past. Um, so though for the other risk factors to consider is patients with prior history of rheumatic heart disease, um, anyone with age-related degenerative valvular lesions, patients with hemodialysis, and really any pre-existing uh, conditions like diabetes, HIV, um, IV drug use, of course. Um, but typically now in the United States, we're seeing a, a more predominant um, nosocomial being a risk factor for endocarditis, given the fact that most patients are coming to the hospital, they're getting antibiotics while here. Um, so that, that raises the, the resistance and um, predisposition for endocarditis. Uh, so microbiologically wise, um, a strep staph is 80% of the bugs that we see. Um, you could also see fastidious infections with the HACIC group. I won't go over every little thing. Um, it's a pretty large, but I'll, I'll make sure that I have it up here. Um, you guys could read that. Uh, essentially, you also want to be concerned that patients could have Brosiella, species Coxiella, Burdenola is also one of the common, uh, not common, but one of the things that we potentially want to rule out as well. If you have a high concern for endocarditis and you don't have any any bug um, to pinpoint it at. Um, so in terms of the pathogenesis, so how does this happen? Um, it really comes down to endothelial damage from many different causes. You could have a really high turbulent blood flow um, from patients with regurgitations that over time could, ha could cause endothelial damage. Um, and... Also, patients with IV drug use, there's solid particles in the drugs that they're, they're um, injecting. And after many repeated IV drug uses um, or injections, they, over time, will have endothelial damage and eventually will, will become bacteremic, causing seeding of that bacteria in the valves. Um, so there's many other causes, but for now, I'm going to, for the sake of the video being short, I'm going to continue on. Uh, for the classifications, um, typically, we would call it acute, subacute, or chronic. Now we're categorizing this as patients with prosthetic valves, patients with native valves, um, or patients with nosocomial um, endocarditis. 
Um, and the treatment for that were, will be different, as we will discuss briefly in, in a few minutes. Um, the outcomes for patients, um, it, the mortality ranges from 15 to 22 percent, with the five-year mortality being approximately 40 percent for most patients. So the big question um, that we learned in med school is the DUCE criteria. Um, um, it's very, very long, but it's a very, this is pretty simple if you think about it. Uh, at least I'll hopefully I'll make it more condensed and uh, systematic for you guys. But really what it comes down to is this is more of a both a diagnostic criteria, but also could be used um, to figure out if patients have a higher likelihood of having endocarditis. So there's a two clinical criteria that you can use. We have two major, one major and three minor, or five minor by itself. Um, so the major clinical criteria is positive blood cultures for infective endocarditis. You could have evidence of endocardial involvement. Um, and then you could have, um, that's kind of the only two, right? So you have blood cultures that are positive. So really, all the all the uh, microbes that we talked that we talked about, um, including uh, staph, strep, as well as the HACE group, um, blood cultures, two blood cultures that are positive for those uh, microbes, uh, or a single uh, blood culture that's growing Coxiella brunelletti, um, and then obviously evidence for endocardial involvement uh, for infective endocarditis patients with a, really any vegetations, uh, any um, abscess, or anything uh, in the valves or any new valvular regurgitation um, could be diagnostic for the, fitting that major uh, clinical criteria. For minor, really, you could think of it more of a systemic future. It's like, so what are the vitals? What are the physical exams? That's how I think about it. Um, so though, if you think about it like that, any really any vital change, any physical exam finding will be fitting for the minor clinical ki- criteria. Um, and also, just any blood culture that's positive could be minor clinical criteria. Does not uh, blood culture does, does not meet the the above bu- bugs that we mentioned, um, so that's the Duke's criteria. Um, and just something in FYI, um, all these Janeway lesions, splinter hemorrhages, data showed um, that only like about five percent patients have like Janeway lesions, rod spots. Only five percent splinter hemorrhages, eight percent. So just physical exam findings alone is not diagnostic. That's why it's part of the minor criteria, like I mentioned. So all these major minor, it all has to do with sensitivity. Uh, for um, patients for possible endocarditis, like I, like I said, they're not specific, but they're more sensitive. Um, so that means that if patients who have this doesn't mean they have endocarditis. You still want to do other studies to prove it. Um, so in terms of um, um, diagnosis, like I said, you get a transesophageal echocardiogram. If that's negative, but you have a very high pro- pretest probability that it is endocarditis, you could potentially get a transesophageal endocardi- um, echocardiogram. Um, in terms of treatment, so we'll discuss treatment ver- uh, surgery versus medical management. We'll start talk about briefly about medical management. So the antibiotic coverage really depends on, uh, like I said, the classification of endocarditis, whether it's um, native versus prosthetic. If it's a native valve inf- infective endocarditis, those are more of a common microorganism. The duration is typically two to six weeks, uh, depending on the bug. Uh, if it's enterococcal infective endocarditis, you could potentially do six weeks. Clinically, at least from my experience, um, very little experience uh, being uh, only a f- second year, but I've seen most patients just do six weeks. Um, and I have to look p- about more data to see how safe we feel about given two weeks. Um, so for patients with inf- uh, prosthetic, so the antibiotic coverage for these patients with infective empirically, you want to do vancomycin and ceftriaxone, or instead of ceftriaxone, you could do a gentamicin. Um, for infective endocarditis involving a prosthetic valve, Duration is usually longer; it's six weeks. Um, the the regimen is about the same than native infective endocarditis. The only exception is that um, patient. There were some uh, patients who were actually on ref, on rifampin, um, but just because they found um, I have to look and see. But I believe that they found more data to support patients with uh, have more uh, decreased mortality with uh, staphylococcal prosthetic valve infective endocarditis. Um, so I see that sometimes, and the reason for that is because they're prosthetic valves, so they usually do it. Um, but you do the same van, ceftriaxone, or gentamicin on top of rifampin for a prosthetic valve endocarditis. Um, so the other big uh, topic that uh, I feel I didn't know much about was surgical treatment. And being in the medicine side, um, that's also important for us to know is knowing when should we be calling cardiothoracic surgery. There's actual guidelines for this now. Um, it was adopted by Habib et al., and there was an actual research um, that was done uh, in 2012 um, called Early Surgery Versus Conventional Treatment for Infective Endocarditis by Kang. And this was actually um, a study done, in, I believe, in Asia. Um, and 
it looked at really the medical management versus um, patients who were getting early surgery, and it was all a randomized controlled trial, I believe. Uh, but essentially, they, these guidelines are um, because we did find a, a mortality benefit to early surgery if patients met criteria for that. So what are the criteria? What is What should we look at? So patients, there's different categories, indications. For patients with heart failure and controlled infection or prevention of embolism. So for heart failure, the patients should be getting emergent, meaning they should be going to the surgery within 24 hours if they're essentially in cardiogenic shock or really refractory pulmonary edema. Uh, you should be calling cardiothoracic surgery at that point. Uh, patients with urgent uh, under the heart failure category are just really anyone who's hemodynamically stable, but they have severe acute regurgitation or um, you know persistent heart failure, but their vitals are stable. Um, because they, you want to call them because there's a, a component that they could crump at any moment, so you want to call them um, for uh, urgent, meaning less than a week um, early surgery intervention. Um, patients with uncontrolled infection, if they, if you can, urgent would be if patients are having a really ap large abscesses in the, uh, in the TTE or persistent fevers with positive blood cultures for five to seven days. Um, and then also urgent for in the setting of prevention embolism is patients with large vegeta vegetations about 10 millimeters or one centimeter in length after or more embolic episodes. Um, so despite even antibiotics, so even after giving them antibiotic, antibiotic therapy, they're still throwing clots. That, that's when you should be calling them for sure. Um, the other one would be obviously patients who have endovegetations. They might not have um, embolism, but they have you know complicated course of heart failure, persistent infection, or abscess. Um, so really, it's greater than 10 millimeters. At that point, they should probably already have all the other features. Um, so I would call um, cardiothoracic, even if it's going to 10 millimeter, and I'm not sure about the other features, uh, because most likely they do have them. Um, obviously, persistent infection um, with the large vegetation is probably common. Uh, but the other one would be if it's just purely a greater than very large vegetation, greater than 15 millimeters uh, by itself, that's urgent, uh, definitely. So the big takeaway this, of this is emergency is only if patients um, are meeting the above two criteria, as you can see here, patients with fistula into the cardiac chamber or um, refractory pulmonary edema or cardiogenic shock, I'll be calling cardiothoracic surgery for these patients um, for an emergent early intervention. Um, so that's kind of most of the, the, the data that we know. Uh, in brief, I'm going to discuss a recent article that was published in January 31, uh, 2019. In New England Journal, it was by Dr. Everson, um, and this was a study that was conducted in the Danish Heart uh, Foundation. It was called the POET Clinical Trial, um, in other words, uh, partial oral treatment of endocarditis, and it was a nationwide investigator initiative, multi-centered, randomized, unblinded, non-inferiority trial. Uh, it was performed at cardiac centers in Denmark. So the patient populations of these um, candidates were actually uh, beyond just having the endocarditis. They were, for the most part, very they didn't have that many comorbidities. The people that were undergoing this, the physicians, had a lot of experience with endocarditis. Um, so just take that, um, just understand who's conducting the research and who is the, who are the patients, because that would limit how much we can extrapolate from these studies. So the, what the study found was that after they randomized patients who were going to get, uh, so what they did is they had uh, 400 patients who were stable. They were not in cardiogenic shock or anything. Um, they had left-sided endocarditis by streptococcus, entero enterococcus focalis, staphylococcus, or coagulase uh, negative staph. Um, they were initially treated, all of them, uh, with IV antibiotics for 10 days. But then after 10 days, half of the group was switched over to an oral antibiotic treatment. Um, and then eventually, if feasible, patients in the oral treated group were discharged eventually to outpatient. The primary outcome for this was all-cause mortality. Uh, really unplanned cardiac surgery, so like any other um, events they might have needing surgery, uh, like uh, shock or or so, embolic events or relapse of bacteremia. So they looked at most of the co common or the more severe complications of endocarditis. Um, so they looked at it uh, from the time of randomization until six months after antibiotic treatment was completed. So what they found was basically that um, the primary outcome occurred in 24 patients, 12 percent, and 9 uh, percent of patients in the orally treated group. And they really, the p-value was 0.4, uh, so it was not statistically significant. So it showed that the oral group was non-inferior to the um, to the patients with IV antibiotics. So like I said, this is some study that we were looking at, or we looked at, but it's really has, hasn't been um, extrapolated yet from my experience. 
uh, at least from what I've seen, because the population was different and the, the physicians who were doing the study had a very sick, a very strong experience with endocarditis. Uh, but just something to think about. Uh, there's other research being done currently about oral antibiotics for patients with um, osteomyelitis that's, that was complicated by endocarditis. Um, and there, I think, I believe uh, that's still ongoing. Uh, so I just hope that you guys enjoyed the video. And like I mentioned, again, a uh, small disclaimer, this is just all my own advi my own interpretation of the studies. This is not um, anything um, that you should follow. This is more for education, for fun. Um, and so I do not, um, I'm not responsible for yeah, This is, you see, I've never seen that. Never seen that. That's huge. So she dropped them and we'll have a discussion. In the end, we're all here to learn. And I think that we should always put our knowledge um, to question. Uh, we should always question our knowledge. We should always uh, question other people. Um, that's the only way to learn and that's the only way to grow because ultimately we're all doing this because of our patients and we should never feel that we're always that we should, we're always comfortable with our knowledge because knowledge is always um, expanding. So thank you for your time. Um, I hope you guys are enjoying the videos. Have a great day.